All right, John, welcome to the podcast. It's really good to be with you. It's very, very, very pleased to be here. I feel very fortunate to be on your show, Elena. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, listen, we're just going to dive right in. I am really excited to have you here because you have such a rich history of just the things that you've done in your life and the experience that you've had. And I think that I want to just dive right in. So give us a little bit of a snapshot. You have a lot of history, so I'm going to leave it to you in terms of what you want to talk about. So, but tell us your history, just a little bit about kind of who you are and how did you come about to being where you are today? Um, as, as a as a career person, I wound up a lawyer. Uh, I've repented myself of that now. But when I was a young guy, I was you know I was a, a choir boy and an altar boy. My mom raised me in the Catholic Church. I've uh, repented myself of most of that too. But uh, I but I honor uh, the the principles uh, still, and, and I'd be happy to speak about that. Um, I I went uh, you know I, I I was a hippie. You know I was arrested when I was uh, seventeen for selling LSD to policemen who were dressed up like you know hippies. And uh, I wound up, you know, in prison for eight months when I was 18. And uh, that was a very interesting uh, view of the world. And it prepared me well for later on in my career. Uh, after practicing law for uh, about a dozen years or so, uh, we started an entrepreneurial business uh, related to, it's not, not unlike uh, PayPal, uh, but it was uh, devoted to the online gambling industry, which was just exploding around uh, 2000 when we started it. And we started a business called NetTeller. That was uh, uh, online money transfer service uh, in aid of the uh, online gaming industry. Uh, in those days, it was mostly about sports betting, but uh, then poker uh, hit the internet, and, and that and that blew it wide open even further. Uh, in 2003, we went public on the London Stock Exchange, and we received, uh, you know, achieved the market cap of around two billion dollars, uh, and. At, that at that time I owned 27 percent of that so theoretically I was you know about half of a billionaire uh and then about three or four years after that Uncle Sam put up his hand and uh, uh threatened um you know three 20-year offenses uh racketeering uh, money laundering and conspiracy and uh we were uh you know, my uh, my my our stock value went from about six and a half pounds down to sixty pence overnight. So, you know that that was uh, you know a bit of a, a rude awakening for us, but uh, not not entirely unexpected. Um, I was out on bail on those charges for about six years in the United States and had a wonderful experience uh, living on the West Coast and in Malibu. Um, I did some musical recording with some of the greatest studio musicians in the world, and what a thrill that was to learn you know how to work with those guys mm -hmm. and i've written a couple of books uh, the um my my book all's well where thou art earth and uh, and why where thou art earth and why is uh, sort of an audacious ramble through our history as a species and what i see to be a very positive uh, in, um, almost eternal future um the, i i i kind of perceived in my uh you know day-to-day -day experience elena that the uh um you know the the world didn't need any more uh sort of uh negative anticipation <laughs> there's, there's enough of that going around and and it occurred to me that um you know um not that my objective was to be positive but my actual view of our of us as a species is is, is a very very positive view and um i felt that uh, that might be um a good thing to devote the remainder of my career to um and uh you know, it's uh, it's been very rewarding for me, but not very many people are paying attention. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to pay attention. I would love to ask you about it uh, for sure. But listen, what I've heard so far is like a lawyer, entrepreneur, um, you're into uh, music as well. So how did, you know, an author, a writer, and I find this so interesting because I feel like there should be more people like yourself, right? So kind of multidimensional so I'm just curious, like, how do you know, did you kind of fall into this thing? Did you always have this passion for music? And then a lawyer, did that come out, out of, you know, like, how did, how did you experience as an entrepreneur, I guess, impact your law career? And did you kind of lose passion for it? I'm just curious, like, how did you jump from these different, completely different worlds? What? Hey, you, thanks for watching. If you're enjoying this episode, make sure to share it with friends and family who might find it interesting. Make sure to hit the subscribe button as well to stay up to date on weekly new videos that are going to be coming out with some awesome guests that I bring on. And uh, if you have any questions, use the comment section to ask me questions, to interact. I look forward to talking to you.
Well, it's not as um, it's not as elevated as you might think. Um, I, I wound up uh, in law school uh, because I got pregnant, and um, I didn't have enough math or, or science to be a doctor or uh, or an accountant, and and that you know didn't leave much. The only thing I could do was read, and so that that left law. So I became a lawyer, and uh, I practiced law for about fifteen years. Um, but the entrepreneurial thing, uh, you know, law wasn't a, law didn't really massage my soul very much. You know, I found it to be my many many of my friends found very very rewarding careers in law. But um, I re, I deeply appreciated the legal education, Elena, because you know it teaches us. You know, the one the one thing it does teach you don't you don't they don't teach you that much law, but what they do teach you is where to find the answers to your problems, and that's a very wonderful education in itself. Not that you know. What, how you're going to solve a problem, but you know where to go to figure out how to solve it. And that's, that's mm -hmm. a very encouraging thing. But the other thing is too, when we're a lawyer, you know, the, you've heard that old adage that it's a poor lawyer who uh, stops researching when they find the answer that suits them. Um, of okay. course, there's another lawyer out there who's working just as hard as you are and probably harder to find one that doesn't suit you. And so we need to go on. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's almost as if the, the, the fundamental, um, ethos of the profession is to look at things from the other person's point of view. And that's that that is um, uh, is a great lesson to learn uh, both professionally and also in our uh, personal lives. So I, I enjoyed that part of the law. All the rest I didn't like very much. And the entrepreneurial part of it actually was uh, just as uh, um, kind of a motivated um, uh, in a in a um, you know, in an incidental way, uh, the um, it, uh, you know, I became an entrepreneur because I wasn't enjoying law. So it was a way to escape from the law. But one of my clients, Steve Lawrence, um, came up with this idea of um, how to, uh, uh, if, if, if somebody, you know, uh, brought some professionalism, responsibility, reliability, security to the uh, online money transfer side of the online gaming industry, that that might make a good little business model. And uh, so we started that out together and I helped him with it. And, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, it was, uh, we, 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 we won the run for the roses. <laughs> you know, we, we got the big one. Of all of the dot-com companies that were starting around 2000, when we did, you know, there were lots of them go were going for huge uh, multiples of their earnings because they didn't have any earnings. But mm -hmm. NetTeller was the only one that actually had cash flow and we had massive cash flow. When we were arrested in 2003, we were uh, halfway through our fiscal year and we were uh, uh, halfway uh, halfway uh, towards transferring $14 billion that year but between, you know, American gamblers and offshore um, gambling sites, you know, so... That was uh, so it, it went we went through the roof without ever advertising once. <laughs> but, uh, so that was what an interesting. Year was that? What year was that? I'm just going. When, well, when we, this... we, we started NetTeller in 2000 and um, we were uh, arrested in uh, 2007, the beginning of 2007. All right. Well, yeah, that was when the internet boom at the 2000s. Yeah. Interesting. I was just thinking back. Interesting. All right. Yeah. So, so what would you say? I just have one question about that because I'm sure people ask you about this all the time, and I don't want to get stuck on this topic. I'm really curious to learn about you as a musician and and as an author and this 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 positive outlook you have on us as a human species. And I want to get into that a little bit more. But I'm just curious because I assume that experience was probably a humbling one, going from you know being up top with all that cash and all that money to then spending some time behind bars what was the biggest lesson for you i'm sure there was many but what was like your biggest like was there was there a life-changing moment i don't know I'm just, just I, I i learned some things that i didn't know before but the major things that i, I think i took from it uh, elena were um sort of affirmations of things that i if i didn't know them already i intuited them but all of the guys that I met in prison, I was in prison in, in Los Angeles and also in Manhattan. So only the best prisons. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I was in Manhattan, I was in the same prison that they kept uh, they kept El Chapo in. And I was in the same prison that, um, you know, Jeffrey Epstein woke up one morning and found out that he had committed suicide. Do you remember that? Oh, wow. <laughs> so and it, when that was, uh, you know, down on uh, Olive Street in downtown Manhattan. So mm -hmm. the thing that I learned in answer to your question is that all of the people who are in there are just the same as you and me and most of them are probably uh bad luck and, and one of the 
strongest elements of the bad luck was the color of their skin. You know, I was on a, I was on a range of uh, 96 men and, um, you know, 85 of them were, you know, uh, were, were black guys and, you know, the, the rest were, you know, brown <laughs> yeah. and, um, they're, and they're just, you know, we were all, we were all sort of the same, you know, when I, when I was 17 or 18, I went to prison in Canada for, um, you know, selling hallucinogenic drugs. Um, you know, um, I had, that was a good sort of uh, primer for this other experience. And, and I, and I realized now some people ask me if that wasn't sort of a scary experience. It would have been quite a bit more scary for me if I hadn't had that experience when I was younger, but the mm -hmm. thing that you have to know when you go to prison <laughs> is you can't behave like you're don't, you don't belong there you can't behave like you're better than the other people because they, they they that 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 annoys uh prisoners a lot <laughs> i would imagine so i would so, imagine so yeah so if we if you show respect uh you have to show respect and you also have to um um you know uh demonstrate that you require to be respected as well and when if you do that then people basically treat you pretty well you know mm -hmm. but um those poor poor guys in america you know they've particularly people of color have uh, uh the, the the cards are stacked against them so egregiously you don't you know you don't really and you don't really see it until you watch how they get treated in prison that's you know that's a you know the um the level of uh um condescension and uh and uh you know superiority and whatnot that uh the the most of the system de demonstrates towards those people is uh, uh really disheartening so mm -hmm. that was that was the great lesson i learned from you know going to prison again <laughs> uh, no that's that's that i mean that, that that's uh i mean i'm glad you're talking about because i think that's that's what we all we often think that we tend to what's the word to demonize people that are in prison but not all of them are you know like you said some of them are just there for very petty things and and you know what i mean so it's it's not always that they are these horrible people right it's just sometimes it really is you know wrong place at the wrong time and perhaps some wrong decisions but then again who hasn't made some bad decisions in their lives it's just whether you got caught or not right I know this sounds a little bit stereotypical too, but you know, it, the reality is that uh, the really bad guys aren't in prison. It's, you know, it's uh, it's low, oh, yeah. low, yeah, low level losers, point. you know, um, and you know, the, the really bad guys are out uh, making billions. You're not wrong <laughs> but, there. You're not wrong there. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I look wrong. at, uh, have you ever lived in Russia? I have, I have first part yeah. of my life. Yes. First half of it. Yeah, I, um, I spend a lot of my time now uh, watching uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and uh, and kind of analyzing his behavior. And um, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be uh, we're pretty spoiled in North America. We think that uh, you know uh, he seems like a nice guy. You know, everybody over there really likes him. Donald Trump really likes him. You know, but no, they just they just really don't understand what freedom means and what the lack of it. You know, what the lack of it is. So it's. Uh, it's yeah. uh, you know we we've we've got a lot of work to do on Earth, but a lot of it is in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you're not wrong. I can't even argue that. I mean, it's my country, but you're not wrong. I mean, there's a reason I'm in between UAE and USA. You know what I mean? So it's sure. uh, it's yeah. it's definitely um, yeah. We have a lot of challenges there, and um, yeah. But let's not talk about Putin. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, let's go I ahead. I still want to go back and visit from some time. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> um, so listen, so thanks for sharing that. I think that's a, that's a very, it's a very, um, uh, I don't know what's the word, but it's, it's, a, it's a really good observation um, from your time there. I'm curious to shift to, how did you get into music after that? When was that? Was that after your, uh, after you've been released or how did you get into music? Well, I've been into, I've, you know, I've been a musician since I was a kid. My mom uh, introduced me to music when I was a child. I was in the St. Mary, Mary's Cathedral uh, Boys Choir when I was about eight years old. And we sang, you know, beautiful liturgical music, Palestrina, uh, wonderful stuff from, uh, you know, from the Renaissance. And there's, it is, you know, it's wonderful music. And I, you know, I took piano lessons and, uh, you know, I, when I was about 13 years old, it figured out that, um, you know, girls like, guitar players better than they like piano players so, <laughs> so 
I started playing guitar, but I played guitar and, and, and piano most of my life. And, um, and I started writing songs in, you know, in, when I was, you know, 30 or 40 or something like that. And then by the time, uh, by the time I was arrested, uh, I, had, I already had it in my mind to make some proper records. Uh, and then, you know, when you're kind of, uh, when I was arrested, I was in, uh, in uh, Malibu in California and um, the, the, my bail terms were that I was not allowed to travel home to Canada. I had to stay within that jurisdiction or, uh, or, or go to New York City if the judge wanted to see me there because the, my, we, we call it my beef was in New York City. <laughs> um, but uh, so I was introduced to some people in, in Los Angeles who knew their way around the in industry. Uh, Brian Ahern. Who is a record producer? He's uh, and he, he was married to Amy Lou Harris for about fifteen years, and they have a child together. But they, but Brian produced some really great Nashville records. Um, you know, uh, John Cash, uh, you know, um, George Jones, some of the really great old guys. And he thought, you know, he wanted to listen to my music, and my, my music's not Western music, although it does go there. But it's more like you know, all over the map. But, mm -hmm. anyways, he said, you know. Uh, well, you know, you could be you could be stranded in worse places than Los Angeles if you want to make a record. <laughs> so, so we did. He he phoned up. He took me to. Uh, do you know who T Bone Burnett is? He's a, he's uh -huh. he's kind of a well known guy. He does he does those. Uh, well, do you remember? Uh, the, let's see. Robert Plant and Alison Krauss have a couple of records out now. They, they were that he produced them. He produced records for movies like Oh Brother Where Art Thou? And you know he's a he's he's a you know big shot and. He took me to meet T-Bone and T-Bone made us coffee <laughs> and, and he, uh, you know, t just told us who we should, you know, gather, gather around us. And uh, he rec recommended the, these really, really great players. And uh, we went in the studio and, you know, we'd go in in the morning and all these famous guys that I was in awe of. Um, we, you know, we'd all sit around with a, a cup of coffee and a donut and they'd say, okay, well, let's do a song, play a song. And I just have to, I just pick up my guitar and sing them, as, sing these guys a song. And it was, it was, it was a, an astonishing experience. And then, you know, um, they'd say, that's a pretty good song. Let's try it out. And then they'd, they'd kind of mess around with it for about 20 minutes and then uh, they'd go. And it was, you know, I just, you know, to hear all of these guys devoting their, um, massive talents to, to my music was just a, a constant thrill it was one of the best experiences of my life That's and awesome. um and all, and all of those uh, uh all, all, all of this uh, there's actually two sessions i did two sessions one in 2007 one in 2009 both the time well, during the time i was out on bail and um each of those uh sessions produced uh, double cds so there's about 40 songs and um they're all available now on the streaming services so if you spell my name right, <laughs> your, your oh, listeners yeah. can go listen there for whenever they like. They're also uh, uh, all they're all you can hear. You can hear all the music as well on my uh, johnlefave.com website, mm -hmm. which also has an introduction to my writing as well. Absolutely. I'll definitely check it out and I'll make sure to share the links in the description as well, for sure. Um, listen, um, so just to shift because i'm really curious to know so I, we've covered your kind of lore career and your entrepreneurship journey and kind of what you learned from that and then to your music but then you also recently got into writing and that's what i really want to dig deeper into is the book because before we started recording you gave me a little glimpse of what it's about and it sounds like something i might be interested in so i want to dig deeper so tell me a little bit about what inspired the book what it's about and then we'll go from there when I started writing the book, I, you know, everybody thought it would be a good idea for me to write my story because it was, uh, you know, it is kind of a fascinating story. Not that many people make, you know, half a billion dollars, <laughs> you know, and, I, and, um, and then, you know, give it all away again or lose it, you know, but, um, and I, and I tried that, but it, it was not, it, I didn't, I w it wasn't very satisfying for me, actually, Atlanta, to uh, be, you know, writing all of these sentences that start with I and end with me. Um, and um, I, I felt like what I wanted to do, if I was only going to write one book in my life, <laughs> but it should be about something more important than some, you know, tawdry rags to riches story. And, um, and I, so I decided what, I, you know, I just, you know, they say you, what you, you know, write what you know. And so what I, what I know was, is I'm not satisfied with the way our society is going and um, it needs a new, needs new direction. Uh, and uh, so I, it was just I decided what I would try to write is an analysis of you know what we've achieved as a species uh, in our learning and in other ways, 
uh, and um, what what was the best way forward for us? You know, we have a responsibility to our descendants, and uh, uh, we're we're not considering them. Uh, uh, quite obviously, we're not considering them carefully enough. <laughs> so that was that's about the size of it. One of the things that I came up with was that, um, you know, um, well, we're we're super privileged in our society, right? We're all, you know, I mean, I'm among the privileged. I'm, you know, among the most privileged. But you know, even just normal people in Canada and America and you know in the Western world. Um, we have all these wonderful things that we take for granted and um, you know, all, all the time. And we, we take them for granted so much sometimes that we haven't even thought of them. For instance, uh, you know, respect and security of the person, you know, of ourselves, right? Um, reasonable access to food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, reasonable access to the tools of self-improvement, education, health, uh, basic finance, and justice, access to justice. And last but not least, access to um, a, a healthy environment. And, you know, and we, we sort of take all of these things for granted in our society, uh, that we're, as if we're entitled to them. And you know what? I think we are. They are the entitlements of freedom. We should take them for granted. But when it gets kind of a challenging, more challenging thing is when try to understand um, what distinguishes us from uh, people in you know Somalia or you know Mozambique or you know places where they cannot take these things for granted, mm -hmm. and, and, and try as I might, I couldn't really figure out anything important that distinguishes us sufficient to say that well you know you know we 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 get to take all these things as entitlements, but uh, they don't, and you know the only answer that you can really come up with is well you know we're lucky and they're not so. <laughs> And that, I, didn't, I didn't find that to be very satisfying uh, a way, place to land. So and, and so what I realized is I think that, you know, the starving lady in Somalia with the baby dying at her dusty breast um, and, and, and us have uh, nothing distinguishes us sufficiently that we're entitled to those things and they are not. So where that led me was to the idea that, and this is an idea we've had since we were kids too, was, you know, that uh, freedom comes at a cost. And, you know, when we were kids, they would tell us, you know, it comes at the cost, the highest cost, they would tell us quite, you know, earnestly. And what they meant by that, I think, was giving our lives in wars to, you know, um, to defend freedom for everybody else. And that seemed sort of right to me, but also kind of a bit odd because, you know, uh, maybe um, one in a couple of hundred thousand of us ever have to pay that price, <laughs> all the rest of us get it for free. So, you know, we have to pay the price, but only one in a million of us have to ever pay the price. No, that can't be right. Here's what I think the cost of freedom is. Every day that we enjoy the benefits of freedom, we have an obligation to strive with whatever tools we have, whatever mechanism we have, to strive to assure that others who are less fortunate in the Freedom Department are headed in that direction too. And uh, if we do that, then I think our we have, we have earned our freedom. You know, we've paid the price for it. If we do that all the time, really, all you have, all we have to do, I think, is convince people that this idea is, you know, that of, of entitlement and, and responsibilities of sharing. Uh, um, are, is where is the principle that we should adopt. And if we do, then we actually have earned the benefits of freedom. But here's the cute little aphorism I came up with that I think um, sort of describes it. Um, people who are happy with the benefits that freedom has dumped in their lap, but could not care less about people who are less fortunate in the freedom department, haven't earned their freedom. They've merely taken liberties. Mm -hmm. Right. And so and that leaves us, I think, in a response and it, that leaves us with a very uh, in a very challenging position, because how do we take those things that we take for granted and then make sure that, um, you know, uh, uh, some young lady in Ethiopia who's about to get her clitoris gashed off with a rusty old knife, you know, how do how 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 do we like march into that country and say, you can't do that anymore? Well, and, you know, it's a, and it's a difficult problem, but there is a solution to the problem. And I think the problem is that some things trump sovereignty, right? You know, and if you can't, you know, if Ethiopia can't look after the, 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 their young uh, women who are facing that kind of thing, 
um, then uh, we have to step in and, and, and protect them. We have a, re a responsibility. And, and fortunately now with the internet and whatnot, young people in Ethiopia probably don't have that difficult a time um, finding who to turn to in their society to get help when that challenge is, is confronts them, you see? Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, and uh, if they turn to us on the internet and say, I need some help, somebody's gonna come to try to mutilate me. We have to actually go help them or else make sure somebody there does that mm -hmm. that comes with some challenges and i don't and i don't deny that there are some challenges when when you start to confront ideas that are so bred in the bone with us like sovereignty but mm -hmm. i i liken them um elena to um the, the responsibilities of being a parent you know when when we become parents we have an obligation to uh do the best for our children in any way we can and um without knowing exactly how what that means what what we're going to have to do so the idea is that uh we know we have the obligation if we have the obligation not knowing how to fulfill it does not relieve us of the obligation yeah. we have to find out a way you know and that's what you know so it's it's like it's like parenting it's to say this you know we, we you you can have a responsibility that you have no idea how to fulfill Mm -hmm. yeah, right and, yeah. that, and i think that's the situation and it is for us for all the people in the world who's um you know that that i you know i speak of that one example because it's so egregious but it you know th th there's so many other things too i mean there are you know 20 percent of the people on the planet are well prepared in the sense of their human resources um to uh to uh to do their best for everybody around them and about 80 percent are not we need to educate these people and give them the tools of self-improvement, mm. you know, and people, people resist it. You know, sometimes I think, well, you give money to these bums, you know, that you just give, you just turn and make them dependent and turn them into bums. And, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a strange attitude that particularly Americans have about that kind of generosity. I think I call it a responsibility. It happens to be generous, but I think it's a responsibility to help people too. Mm. But, you know, when, when America was started, America was started on a very positive view of human nature. You know, Adam Smith, when he wrote, you know, the Wealth of Nations and the idea of uh, the invisible hand uh, in, in, the, in in economy, he actually that he that idea first came up in um, his first book, which is sixteen years older than the Wealth of Nations, and Adam Smith thought it was a superior work. Uh, of it, uh, the, it's called the the um, the theory of moral sympathy. And in that book, one of the things he points out is that people are basically good. Quaint, quaintly, he calls people men. <laughs> but I'm quite, sure, men back then. <laughs> I'm quite sure he meant men or I meant people. <laughs> so, but and what his idea was was that if you turn good people free to do the best they can and give them all the tools they can to do their best, everybody will be looked after. Good people will look after the people who are less fortunate. You know, and it's a very positive, it's a very, very positive view of, of human nature. Now in America, you know, well, you know, we can't, we can't give a guy 600 bucks in COVID because then we're going to turn him into a bum. That's not a very positive view of human nature. Yeah. And that's yeah. where, and, and that's where we've come to in our society. So, um, and I, you know, so I, I think it, it's, it, we're at a time in our development where we have to ch challenge those views aggressively and, 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 ret and return to return to that more positive view where I'm going with that. I mean, I got into that because I was talking about being generous and some people are going to beat you for it. Some people are, and I think we just have to grow up, Elena. We just have to say, yeah, that's a cost of business. 15% of the people are going to take the money and be bums get used to it, grow up. That does not exonerate us with respect to the other 85%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And when we do help the 85%, productivity is just going to explode. All of those people are going to be creative. They're going to do their best to look after themselves and their family, the same as everybody else does, except those 15%. And, and the world is just going to be get, get more and more wealthy. The more product, the more product, product, the more productive we are, the more wealth there will be. And I've talked to some uh, fairly heavy hitters on the economic side about this, and they agree with me that theoretically wealth is almost infinite on earth. 
you know, the more productive we are, the more value there's going to be, the more, the more people will be, you know, the, the, the more people there will be to buy Netflix subscriptions <laughs> and, and right. And the more people there will be to create Netflix content. Do you see what I mean? It's just mm -hmm. like, it's, you know, with, with, with roughly 20% of our society developed, we came up with an Einstein. Mm -hmm. If 80, if a hundred percent of us were developed, there might've been five of them. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know how many geniuses are just, um, you know, kind of dying on the vine. So um, that's yeah. so. Yeah, let me just uh, jump in for just a second. You mentioned yes, please, huh? you've mentioned um, kind of the fact that we have access to technology and that's helpful in many ways. But do you feel that with social media, you know, having having kind of grown up in this in this in a time when social media was not around. I mean, it's very new for us, right? It's in the last, mm -hmm. I don't know, 10, 15 years or something like that, right? That's been really heavy. Um, have you seen that we've become more individualistic as a result or has it brought us more together? Uh, or do you feel we're less empathetic as humans because we're so not in tune with one another? I mean, loneliness and you know, mental health challenges are higher than they've ever been. And part of it is because we're not talking to each other. We're not talking to anybody. In fact, we're just secluded on their on our own and we prefer to live behind the screen and 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 do you feel that that has an impact on us becoming more individual versus coming together as a community as a species as you said i don't yeah i i i, I keep when i when i'm confronted with those sorts of things i keep coming back to the same thing and that is that it's a poor carpenter that blames his tools <laughs> you know the the internet is a tool and some people make wonderful community use of it and some people make terrible, terrible use of, uh, um, you know, f uh, fomenting divisiveness and, you know, uh, making, making people want to fight each other. That's what Vladimir Putin does, right? I mean, he's, you know, he's, they say he interfered with the, uh, you know, they say he interfered with the American election and he probably did try to do it in technical ways, like trying to hack voting machines and stuff like that. But for sure, Elena, the most egregious thing that he's done is stuck his nose into all of these things like anti-vax and you know the big lie and you know they that they, they stole the presidency and all this if i was vladimir putin what i would be doing is i'd be going really hard on anti-vax i'd be going really hard on you know uh you know the the um black lives matter and anti and all those guys how they're destroying the world and you know how they stole the government they stole the presidency from you know from uh, mm -hmm. donald trump and all the and you know, because that sort of disruption in our social media that you talk about um, is the sort of thing that is going to that is making America stumble, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what? Um, I know this is going to sound kind of like uh, pseudo humility, but I think Vladimir Putin's as smart as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the things that are negative about the internet. Are actually propaganda from people who mean us what mean us ill, you know. There and, yeah. and he and he's not alone. I mean, the, the super the, the super rich in America are almost the same. They're the very the selfish wealthy. I call them, you know. Mm -hmm. The selfish wealthy are, are a horrible bunch of people who, you know, what they want really is to. Um, let let me start here on this idea. Mm. That this the, the the most powerful tool that has ever been devised by our species to control the selfish wealthy is constitutional democracy and the powers to tax and regulate. And the powers that they fear the most are the powers to tax and the powers to regulate. And the measure of their fear is how much money they spend on trying to keep those powers to themselves, how much effort they spend trying to discourage people from paying any attention to government. You know, the worst thing that we can do now is say to young people, Government can't do anything right. They F everything up. Everything they do, they always screw up, you know, and every time they put their money in their pocket, that's robbery, the tax, you know, what they're saying is, I don't, you know, I don't want to have any rules to prevent me from doing whatever the heck I want. And I don't want to pay, I don't want to share any money. But the thing that we need to do with young people now is encourage them to understand that the problem isn't with government. The problem is with the people who fit, take the offices. And when young people fill, and they're going to, young people will fill those offices with people who 
are more responsible. They're not uh, kowtowing to the interests of the selfish wealthy. But every time selfish wealthy, every every time people say, yeah, government can't do anything right, the selfish wealthy love it because then everybody decides, well, let's go mountain biking. We could vote or we could mountain bike. Ah, let's go mountain biking, right? And the, and the, the like reality is- Like a distraction is, almost, right? Like a distraction almost, is that what you're saying? It, yes, it is a distraction. Yeah, it's a, you know, the other things are, why would I get involved with politics? I don't like politics, right? Yeah. Why would I want to do politics? I can go mountain biking. But yeah. the reality is that the selfish wealthy and the people who work for them always, always show up to vote. That 30% always comes out, every one of them, every time. And the only way they can be defeated is if all the rest of us don't go mountain biking, if all of the rest of us love constitutional democracy with all our hearts, with so much strength that we devote a big part of our lives to keeping that power out of the hands of the selfish wealthy. I get to tell these stories about rich guys because I was one. <laughs> you have the insights. Right. I got the creds. I got the street creds <laughs> of the, on the billionaire fair enough, side. Fair enough. I've been going on a lot here, Elena, and I don't. You no, know, I, just... I'm listening. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm listening to the story. It's very, it's very interesting, and I'm, I'm just, yeah. And so, I mean, it's. Um, so you mentioned earlier as well, like you're still kind of, you know, you, you have this positive view of us as a society. So if you had this magic stick. You know, or how do you see, I guess, us evolving as species? Like, what do you, what would you like to see? In addition to what you just mentioned about us kind of really collectively being more proactive, more active, essentially, in, in you know, in, in, in asking for what's what's our rights, essentially. But what what would you like to see, I guess, as a change, as a like long term? I know this, this this sounds kind of funny, but it's a, you know, I think that the thing that we need to do is almost the easiest thing on the earth to do. It's a drunkard's dream. That part of us that dreams when we go to sleep, that part with infinitely creative, just astonishingly poetic and, you know, meaningful, right? That part of us <clears throat> does not go to sleep when we wake up. It's there all the time. But we allow it to be distracted all day long by um, I, I, I've got to pay my bills. I got to you know feed my family. I got to finish my education. I got this new business deal. How am I going to finance my new car? I've got a golf game on Saturday, and I got to get new shoes. You know, Marianne's coming over for supper on the weekend, and she's a vegan. So what am I going to? All these thoughts come into our minds all day long, and some of them are valuable, and some of them are not. Some most of them are distractions, but. Yeah. And, the, mo, mo, and and so and when I say distractions, that doesn't mean that they're not necessarily responsibilities. They, they may be responsibilities, but I think they need to be, I, I, I like to encourage people to practice skilled management of attention. And what I mean by that is decide for yourselves, ourselves, decide for ourselves what we're going to use this thing on, this thing that dreams at night when we go to sleep, that doesn't go to sleep in the daytime, what are we going to use it on? That thing that dreams at night when we go to sleep cries all day because we waste it on all of these things. Like, well, how am I going to get onto the, you know, should I go down and buy a lottery ticket? And <laughs> when we could be doing something utterly magical with this, it, what it is, is the consciousness that dwells within us. Mm. So um, <clears throat> what I encourage people to do is to treat all of these ideas that zing through our minds all day long that clutter up our our minds with the static just for half an hour a day treat them uh, for what they are and what they are is friends who drop by without phoning first mm -hmm. you know they're clients who came by without an appointment yeah. and we don't have an obligation to respond to them just because they pop into our minds what we should do for half an hour a day is just intentionally keep those things aside. Yes, they're important. Yes, they're responsibilities, some of them, and they'll wait half an hour. But for half an hour, let that part within us that dreams at night be free in the daytime. And when we do that, wonderful things happen. Mm -hmm. Very, very creative things come up for us. And, you know, solutions to problems, uh, resolutions to, to different cares that we have. And so 
what I think we should do is encourage people to um, let that magic that lies within us be free. Let it be, let it rise to the surface. And it's that simple. It's that simple. If we just stop cluttering up with these, with, with these things that impose themselves on our consciousness constantly uh, mm -hmm. and treat them for what they are, you know, uh, clients without an appointment and, and say, okay, get an appointment. You can talk to me in half an hour. Right now I'm busy doing nothing, right? The thing I wrote about in my book was be still yet still be. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, but John, you know, you mentioned a good point, but I'm just curious how many people are just almost afraid to face, to spend that time alone, because as you mentioned very righteously, that we are very um, privileged, almost spoiled to an extent, and we grew up in such comfortable, I'm talking majority of the people, I mean, relatively speaking, of course, but <laughs> we grew up in pretty comfortable environments, uh, especially in the Western developed countries. Um, and, Anybody who's watching this show has. Yeah, yeah, probably, most likely, absolutely. <laughs> you know, so it's it's the reality is that it's not most people don't face adversity, John. Most mm -hmm. people don't. Um, they have not been super uncomfortable majority of their life, not on that level at least. And I think some of the hardest things we do as human beings is to face ourselves. And if you make that time to be quiet and considering the fact that such a big, big percentage of our population, especially, and again, work, working uh, professionals out there are so disengaged and, con you know, the, uh, unfulfilled in their lives. It's almost like these distractions are escapes to not have to face themselves, right? Because mm -hmm. if we are, you know, so I'm just, and, and I'm just mm -hmm. curious, like, because you've faced a lot of adversity in your life and you've, you know, just your life story has, lots of challenges and obstacles and then also triumphs as a result but what would you say to somebody maybe who's sitting there and saying yeah it's great but i'm afraid <laughs> i'm afraid to do these things and you know i mean it's it's uncomfortable well, change is uncomfortable one of the, one of the things that we're afraid of is that we'll have to look at ourselves honestly and <laughs> and and that that can be very disturbing you know if you're i, I know not everybody's like me but it, the, the ones who are like me have uh been real bastards with other people sometimes on being unkind, uh, being, um, you know, being, being a prick, you know, I've, 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 I've hurt the feelings of lots of people in my life. And yes, when we sit quietly and let ourselves be honest with ourselves and be real, there, there are some challenges, but, um, the, the, the thing that, the thing that, um, the, th the thing that the revelation that I want to give to people is when we do it, yes, we'll have to face some difficult things. We'll have to face some things that we're afraid of, but we're also going to face something that is astonishingly uh, um, beautiful. And that is that that thing that is within us, consciousness, actually loves itself really a lot and it forgives mistakes and it encourages growth and you know so yes there are things to be afraid of when we go within ourselves but i encourage people to go ahead and face that down because it's no big deal you know yeah i've been an asshole you know what there's nothing in my life that feels better than well first of all being generous but the other thing is going to people that i've been bad to and saying to them you know what i feel like a heel I really feel badly because this, you know, 17 years ago, I remember I said something to you and, and it's so liberating, you know, it's so freeing to, you know, to, to so here's, here's another thing, you know, th this is another thing I say that, every, that I'm sure everybody thinks is really Pollyanna, but all we have to do to sleep better at night is just be nice and understand the ways that, un understand the ways that we're not being nice. And mm. don't do that anymore. <laughs> so, be kind. My shirt says be kind. Good for you. That's in, in many in the rainbow colors too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll encourage people to look at that part. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, I think it's a beautiful way to, to end this conversation. Actually. I mean, I, I, uh, I think that, uh, you're spot on and it's it's okay to it's okay to be wrong it's it's okay to make mistakes and um you know it's just facing up to your own bs essentially and that's how we move forward as individuals and as communities and essentially as species as you said so um there's so yeah there's a lot more in us than bs there's some 
astonishingly beautiful awareness and kindness and generosity exists within us all. And, you know, um, you know, I often tell people that, you know, the, uh, the, the dividends of a good investment are that you get more money, but then that's kind of like an addiction. You just think the, other, the only thing you do is get more and get more and get more. Mm -hmm. The dividends of generosity are gratitude. And they, and those dividends go on forever, way beyond they, uh, the gratitude that we engender around us, Elena, lasts way longer than we're going to last. <laughs> I agree. So how's that for positive? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh, listen, it's, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been a beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thank you for that. We went all over I'm, the place and I love it. I feel very, uh, very grateful that you've come here to pay some attention. Norman Fisher is a great uh, American Zen master. And he came to talk to us here on Salt Spring Island a couple of years ago. And he said something that really stuck with me. He said, the most valuable thing that we can pay to people in our society now is attention. And you've just given me a full serving, Elena. So thank you so much. Thank you. I, I really I loved listening to you. So really, thank you so much for a beautiful conversation. Thank you. Maybe we can do this again sometime. And I can't wait to share your book and definitely send it across to me as well. I sure will. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.